morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, we've been uh, biting into these spiritual disciplines uh, the last four weeks. This is our fifth week. We'll be uh, looking at worship today. Uh, the the previous weeks we looked into Bible intake. It took a couple weeks to uh, explore that uh, about the amount of Bible we take in and the quality of the time we spend taking in the Bible and also uh, we looked at uh, meditation, we looked at memorization, we looked at uh, several different things of prayer last week. So uh, many of these spiritual disciplines work together and we, we don't want to beat ourselves up about the spiritual disciplines and whether or not we're neglecting those or not because uh, we need to keep in mind what our purpose for the spiritual disciplines are is and that is godliness okay and um, so speaking of godliness what is uh what are some of the synonyms we gave for godliness if you can remember holy holy loving to be to pursue godliness is to pursue Christ likeness right several things that we uh, look at in terms of what is the goal that's the purpose and then we uh, when we keep that purpose in mind then the spiritual disciplines do not become burdensome they become a joy they become what is considered happiness. Uh, we can we can pursue that. We can pursue those personal uh, spiritual disciplines in such a way that uh, that it doesn't become something mundane and something that we dread, but something that is very uh, delightful. Okay, so replacing that dread with delight. So. And uh, to get us started on worship, then, I wanted to tell this story that our author, uh, Whitney, tells the story of his 10th birthday. Uh, eight of his friends were invited to his 10th birthday. And they were invited days and days in advance. It was a big deal. They showed up to eat cake. All eight friends showed up. They played basketball, football outside. They grilled hot dogs and hamburgers. They, they had themselves a day. He couldn't remember the gifts that uh, his eight friends brought him that day. Um, but he just remembered having a great time with uh, eight of his buddies. And then the perfect ending of this perfect birthday was supposed to happen at a high school basketball game. So they piled in his parents' station wagon, and then they drove to the school, and they piled out. As they all started getting out and going into the gym, he said, well, this is going to end with my gift to them. So he paid 25 cents for each of them to get in, right? Okay. So then um, he said, he, said uh, he was happier than Jimmy Stewart in the closing scene of It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> so that kind of paints the picture until it was shattered when upon entering the gym you can imagine what all his eight friends did they all scattered they went in different directions and they were not to be seen the rest of the night so there was no thanks no happy birthday no goodbye no nothing they left without looking back he spent the rest of his 10th birthday in the stands all alone. He said, growing old alone. The point is not to gain sympathy for this, uh, I guess you would say a very painful childhood memory, right? That would be painful to think, look back on that. And to think what a great day that was, but yet what a terrible memory it ended with. Um, the point is not to just draw sympathy but it, it reminds us of how often we treat God in worship you know we come together where 
he's the guest of honor. Uh, and if possible, we leave him. Think about what we leave him. We leave him a routine, duty-bound gift. We sing a few customary songs. Well, we'll sing as long as they're not new to us, right? Um, then we'll totally neglect him while we focus on each other uh, and enjoy the performance of those that are in front of us. You know, it's much like those 10-year-old friends that we may depart with without a twinge of conscience, awareness of our insensitivity, but we are convinced we have fulfilled our obligation very well. We leave feeling satisfied, feeling that we have um, done our duty. So, to speak. so here's the thing about worship. It's our very purpose. It's our very purpose. We, you know, godliness, we're talking about pursuing godliness. Godliness without worship of God is, is unthinkable. How, did, how would you ever pursue godliness without worshiping? Well, Jesus re-emphasized the idea of worship, and he obeyed the Old Testament command, worship the Lord your God, Matthew 4.10. He says, worship the Lord your God. You know, it's our duty, but it's our privilege um, of all people to worship their creator. Can you imagine having a creator and not be willing to worship? Uh, come let us bow down and worship says Psalms 9, uh, 95, verse 6. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. You know, Jesus also warned us that uh, pursuing godliness could also result in vain worship. He quoted another Old Testament passage saying, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. That, that comes from Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. So why don't we explore the spiritual discipline of worship to see how we can cultivate that discipline in such a way that we're encouraged to do it and to exercise it and to train ourselves to do it, but also cultivate a way of um, to where it's uh, not in vain, that it uh, is fruitful. So worship is easier. We're going to start with this um, Worship is focusing and responding to God. So we're going, to, we're going to look at those two things. What do we do when we worship? We focus and we respond to God. We focus on God and respond to Him. So worship is easier to observe, really, in the Scriptures than it is to define it. It's, it's kind of difficult to come up with a clear definition in words for worship, is it not? <laughs> It's not something we that comes across as easy. In fact, if I said, hey, uh, talk to your neighbor about a good definition for worship, well, we would be here for a few minutes because I think you might struggle with some words. Can anybody come up with an easy, just rolls off the tongue definition for worship? We can come up with some synonyms. What are some synonyms? Words that mean the same as worship. Glorify. Glorify. <clears throat> Praise. Praise. Honor. Honor. Okay. But so we can do that when we say, so how do you come up with a definition for worship? Well, that becomes a little more difficult unless we look at the <coughs> physical examples that are illustrated in the Bible. Okay, so we look at, well, the <coughs> easiest place to go for an example for praise and worship and, and glorifying and honoring God would be Jesus, right? So uh, we know it very well. Worship is easier to observe. So we say, let's look to Jesus. Uh, what are some examples of Jesus and worship? The first one comes to mind may be the scarred hands and the side that he showed to Thomas. What happened? He showed his scarred hands and his side where he'd been crucified. He says, what did Thomas say when he saw them? He said, my Lord and my God. A very simply put form of worship, right? My Lord and my God. Uh, that comes from John 20, verse 28. 
And then another good example of uh, worship that we can observe in the Bible would be from Revelation. Um, Revelation uh, illustrates a, a heavenly worship, worship being done in heaven for eternity. But we can use it as a model. Revelation 4.8, heavenly worship is illustrated as four creatures around the throne worshiping without ceasing with holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You know what? It'd be really hard to get this without first reading it. Let's everybody turn to Revelation chapter 4. And let's read from chapter 4. Let's read uh, verses 8 through 13. Somebody with a booming voice went back, volunteer back there. I'm sorry. <coughs> 8 through 11. I said 13. The four oh, living creatures, <laughs> each having wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. All right, thank you, Jeremy. <coughs> so we see lots of things being emphasized here in this worship. Um, First of all, it's a very rare thing to see in Scripture that um, that designation to God in verse 8. Uh, I've got that marked in my Bible as a very rare occurrence when it, when it refers to God as Lord God Almighty. You see Lord God and you see Almighty God, but when you see Lord God Almighty, that is a rare, uh, you, don't, you don't see that very often in Scripture. So that there's a designation there of all-inclusive. Uh, you are everything to us, okay? So there's a lot of emphasis on that. And also uh, take note that uh, at the end of verse 8, it says they do not rest day or night in saying holy, holy, holy. Their worship never stops for eternity, okay? So that's something to look forward to. All right, now look, worship comes from, the, you know, we talked about a definition, but worship comes from a Saxon word, which I tried to pronounce and I couldn't, so I'm not, I'm not even going to try in front of you guys. But, but that word later become the word worth-ship. So it's easy to see where we get the word worship from, worth-ship. So we worship him by magnifying his worthiness of praise, or better yet, to approach and address God as he is worthy, okay? Because he's already worthy, we are going to offer him praise. Uh, and not necessarily because of his worthiness uh, comes from our praise, but the, but the exact opposite. Our praise comes from his worthiness. Where... Uh, so what, what do you think constitutes his worthiness? What are some things that constitutes his worthiness? We see something right here that I just emphasized a while ago. What was that? Yeah, you mentioned it a while ago. What's that? Okay. Given his son. Okay. His worthy, worthiness of that. Okay. We, we even see his son is the worthy lamb, right? Okay. But... Um, what is it about God that makes him worthy? The creator of all things. Bingo. Creator and sustainer of all things. And what's something? What's the designation I gave here a while ago? In verse, the uh, end of verse 8. Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. That's, 
that's them for eternity and without ceasing recognizing Lord God Almighty. That right there expresses his worthiness, does it not? What about sovereign judge? That came to mind too. Is he not the judge that we are all going to uh, give an account? Okay? So another reason that he is worthy. So we could go on and on with uh, the worthiness of God. And uh, so now let's focus on how we express our worship for that. He's worthy of infinitely more than we can actually give. So think about that for a minute. Uh, the extent to his worthiness, we can't touch it with our worship, right? We can never give enough. Uh, notice also how worthy is mentioned in the verse 11 as the as we just read what does it say there about the worth you are worthy to receive what glory. the same things you all mentioned while ago glory and honor power for you created you created all things okay so the more we the more we focus on him Lord God Almighty the more we understand and appreciate how worthy he is. So go back to focus, our focus on him and how we respond to him. The first thing we have to do is our focus has to be on his worthiness. Okay? And then once we focus on his worthiness, we begin to understand and even appreciate um, what we can do to respond to him in the right way or in the way he expects uh, we often cannot help ourselves when we see a mountain view, a breathtaking mountain view. That's, you know, when I go to the mountains, that's one of the things, you know, had I not been so, there were times when me and some friends were climbing uh, Mount Macon at, in the Smokies, and we would come across a, a bend in the trail, in the hiking trail, and we would, we would have this breathtaking view and we just stop, you know. Had I not been so physically uh, exhausted and muscles cramping, I could have enjoyed it better, right? But um, unfortunately, I had walked a little too far and wasn't ready for it. Uh, but there's times when God presents himself uh, through his creation and we, we can't help ourselves. Like, we have to worship because we, we feel compelled to do that in response to his uh, his his beauty, right? His is everything. He's Lord God Almighty, Creator and Sustainer of all things. Um, so we just can't help ourselves. That's the kind of that's the point we need to get to uh, in any form of worship, not just when we're presented with that. Um, you know, maybe a spectacular sunset or whatever it may be that is causing us to spontaneously respond in praise. So we know that encountering God's worthiness invokes the response of worship, okay? That part's pretty obvious. That explains also why those around the throne in, that we just read about in Revelation, what did those around the throne do? They fell on their faces in worship, saying, for eternity, holy, 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 right? So. Since we're not uh, in heaven to observe that form of worship, that changes things a little bit for us. Okay, we're not in heaven experiencing that. So what do we experience? How is it revealed? Okay, number one, we just, we just um, noticed that his worthiness is revealed through his creation, right? All right, but what's, a, what's another way that God's Worthiness is revealed, not just through his creation, but more specifically through what? Through his word. Exactly. Through his word. And that's a twofold word, right? The first part of that would be Christ. The word. Christ. But the other part of that would be his word. Written. The written word. The scripture. Okay, so 
we look, uh, we notice the word the Bible that we refer to. Um, I think we quoted this the other day, 2 Timothy 3.16. Who's got that? 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Okay. There's that training. We get that from uh, inspired word of God. We know the benefits. We get doctrine. We get reproof. We get correction. We get instruction in God's righteousness. Not in our own, but in God's righteousness. Okay. What about uh, 2 Peter 1? Someone read 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation of prophecy, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this brings in the activity of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, so any question then about how God reveals his worthiness to us through the written word? Pretty evident, right? Let's focus on uh, the other part of his word, Jesus Christ. John 1.1. 1, 1. The beginning was the word, and the word rose God, and the word was with God. Yeah. And then verse 14 reveals what that word is referring to. So flip over to John chapter 1. I want to spend, I want to point out a few things in John chapter 1 actually. So it points out there that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now skip down to verse 14. It reveals who that Word is. Someone read that. And the Word became flesh and, it, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yeah, and then uh, skip down to verse 18. So, the Word makes God known to us. It's the only way we can know God is to know the Word. All right. So, if we want to really know who we're trying to worship, we've got to know Christ. Okay. So verse 18 is uh, kind of the summary of what I wanted to hit on there. Uh, so our responsibility is to seek God out by means of Christ and the Bible. The Holy Spirit has a role of opening our eyes for our understanding, and then we see God revealed in Scripture, and then we can't help but respond. Much like when we see that big sunset, right? Or when we see that mountain vista, we're like, can't help myself. I have to respond with praise and honor and glory. Um, but God is most uh, clearly revealed in Jesus, of course, because Jesus is God. To understand him is to understand God's very nature. So that's why both public and private worship should be based upon and include so much of the Bible. Okay, let's pause right here for any questions or comments you might have on that. The word. Okay, we'll plow on. Um, so, the Bible reveals God to us so that we may worship Him. Public is. Okay, so public worship versus private. Let's get into that just a little bit. Public is a Bible reading and preaching centered. But um, just because public worship is centered on Bible reading and, um, and preaching, the clearest and most direct mode of worship meetings 
obviously. But for those same reasons, Bible intake and meditation are the very heart of private worship. Okay, so what, what do I mean by that? It means that when we're in a public setting, in a corporate worship, the most direct mode we can possibly get is through Bible reading, which, which we do, and preaching. But when you're in a private setting, the most direct mode of worship would be meditation, study, uh, just just taking in as much Bible as we can. Um, and when, when we talked about meditation, remember we talked about how that uh, that's an intrinsic motivation to want more, right? Um, and that comes at the very heart of what we're trying to do with worship. We want to know more and more about him, our subject of worship. So singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are sung, they're sung both to express truth about God and in a worship response to God. Prayer is a response to God. As we have seen revealed in Scripture last week, we talked about prayer being a response to God, and so is giving. So all these forms of worship are responses to God. So in conclusion, since worship is focusing on and responding to God, regardless of what else we are doing, we are not worshiping if we are not thinking about God. All right, so that kind of hits home a little bit. You look at all the things that we've just discussed, and then we realize the routines that we do are oftentimes not exactly us thinking about God. Um, if you're listening to a sermon or you're singing holy, 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 but you're not thinking about how that impacts your relationship with God and how that impacts your relationship with everyone, then you're not really worshiping. So let's explore that a little bit more because worship, we know, is done in what and what? Spirit and truth. Spirit and in truth. Okay? John 4, 23 and 24. What do we see? When you think of worshiping in spirit and truth, who do you think of? <coughs> There was an encounter with Jesus and him. Let's read it. Turn it over to John 4. Woman at the well. Yes, there was a woman at the well, the drinking well. And they had quite the encounter, did they not? Starting in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. We often overlook that last part, don't we? What's God's purpose for us? <coughs> to worship Him. Verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So let's explore this um, idea, the concept of worshiping in spirit and truth. Before we can worship in spirit and truth, we must have within us the one whose name is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit of Truth, as is described in John 14, verse 17. The Spirit of Truth. So there you see that the Holy Spirit is both our source of spirit and our source of truth. Okay? So, be silly for us to talk about worshiping in spirit and truth without mentioning the Holy Spirit, right? So that happens through repentance and faith. Without the one who reveals Christ to us, how can we worship him in spirit and truth? Uh, I like uh, also a reference here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Now here, 
Paul's writing to Corinth, and they're, um, I don't know if you would describe it as misusing or abusing the spiritual gifts. Okay? The spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he reveals something here that about the Holy Spirit that we can't, I don't think we should overlook. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't it very possible that we can walk around saying Jesus is Lord and just keep that on repeat? We can say that all we want to. But does that necessarily mean that we're worshiping? We could, we could use the very words that Thomas used. My Lord and my God. We could, we could use those words all we want. But unless we're doing that with a sincere heart, that's kind of useless. That's kind of in vain. And that doesn't involve the Holy Spirit. So we still sometimes don't worship in spirit and truth, even though we know we can. Worship must be from the inside out, even though we're singing or we're listening to the prayer being prayed in public worship. That doesn't necessarily mean it's sincere worship. So where does the balance come from? This balance between spirit and truth. The balance comes from worshiping in truth. The truth comes from the scripture. And worshiping God as is revealed in the Bible, not necessarily as we would have him. So don't miss that. We oftentimes worship God as Him being the subject of our worship on our terms. Okay? He's the God I want Him to be, so I'll worship Him. Hmm. That's faulty, isn't it? Instead, in order to worship Him in spirit and truth, truth is revealed by the Scripture, and Scripture reveals the nature of God, as we've already decided. <coughs> So even when we have everything what seems like lined up and we're, we're coming to the assembly over and over and over again, but still sometimes we want to worship him on our terms because we want him to be God in our image, what we want him to be, okay? So let's talk about um, where that balance comes from even in that. So worshiping God as he is revealed in the Bible includes worshiping him as both merciful and just. So you can't have one without the other. God is both merciful and he is just. God is um, both love and wrath. Okay, so the Bible reveals him as both the God of love and a God of wrath. A God who both welcomes into heaven, but also condemns into hell. So when we come before God to worship, that's got to be, we got to have both sides of his nature. Okay? Comments or questions on that? It's kind of like Jesus says the baby, baby Jesus is easy to love. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, as, as the man, uh, as the man and has that expectations of us uh, which will make us have to make sacrifices to align with what he wants us to be and I think that's where the rub comes with humanity is sometimes the sacrifices we have to make to be what he wants to worship uh, we're not willing to make uh, more than we want to sacrifice. And you're right. praying sometimes or having sometimes or our time most of the time. Yeah. You're right about that. That's definitely where the rub is. Because like you said, the visual picture we get of God, specifically the word, is he came to earth as a baby, right? And then but then we don't realize how he left is what saves us. Him hanging on the cross, giving his blood and sacrifice, that's the part 
today that saves us. And yet we want to have one without the other. Again, that goes back to what I said earlier about how we want the subject of our worship to be on our terms. Oftentimes. Okay, so we gotta be we have to guard against that. And uh, one way to do that is to train ourselves in this discipline of worship. If we don't if we don't worship in response to truth, then obviously we worship him in vain. I like the way the the author illustrates this. This is pretty cool. So I kind of adapted it to, to my situation. So let's say uh, it's our wedding anniversary. By the way, it is June 19th, and I do know that date. <laughs> In case you are talking to Chrissy later. And I bring home a dozen long stem roses. Yeah, that's rare, but I do that. All right, so, and Chrissy, when, <laughs> upon seeing these uh, long stem roses, she says, oh, they're beautiful. Thank you so much. She gives me a big hug. And in response, I say, kind of matter of fact, like, oh, don't mention it. I was just doing my duty. It's not going to end well, right? You know, I, I felt it was my duty to bring you down. I mean, it, after all, it's our anniversary, right? Well, that's not going to end well. Why is that not going to end well? You didn't Martin, do it because you wanted to. You did it because you had to. Felt like I had to. <laughs> but did I not do a noble thing? Not for the right reason. Okay. Did I not honor my beautiful wife with a beautiful dozen of long stem roses? Not for the right reason. <laughs> yeah. So I can justify all I want. How, so how shall we honor God? I love this quote. This is I forget where this came from, and I probably should have made note of that. How shall we honor God in worship? By saying it's my duty? Or by saying it's my joy. The obvious choice is it's my joy. Now, had I brought to those long stem roses and after the hug, she said, Thank you so much. And I should, well, probably should say, Hey, it made me happy. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Makes me happy to see you happy. Now, that's going to end a lot better, isn't it? Huh? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> So, <clears throat> worshiping with spirit and truth, heart and head, okay, <clears throat> with emotions and thought, that leads to balanced worship. And balanced worship is what we're looking for here, because the spirit and truth, the emotions and the thought, the heart and the head, all those complement each other. They don't necessarily have to go against each other. They very well uh, complement each other. This is important because, you know. We all have those periods of going through the the spiritual desert, you might say. There's, we, we all go through those times, right? Uh, when our fire is somewhat dim, you know, we know we cannot just stop worshiping. But what do we do when we when we leave worship and we don't feel like it was our best? We didn't necessarily put our best foot forward. We didn't necessarily get what we thought we'd get. Are we going to go on some kind of self-inflicted guilt trip and say, I, I don't even know why I bother. You know? Why do I even go to the assembly if that's the only if that's the best I can do on worship? But so we all go through these periods of, you know. We even feel like a hypocrite, right? Oh, I just I just sat through a worship, but I don't think I participated. Okay? We all have that. And there's we talked about the kind of circumstances, the the coincidence of the things that we go through. But remember this. Remember that even your best worship is probably going to be flawed. Right? Even the best you can possibly do is going to be imperfect. In fact, it's often the case when we persevere through the dry times and we say, you know what, I'm not going to stop just because I feel like things aren't going quite as well as I think they should. I'm not going to just stop going because, you know, that's probably when you're going to feel refreshed. When you're going through that desert, 
The only way you're ever going to feel refreshed is when the time and the place. Think about it. When are you ever going to be refreshed unless you're in the assembly in the public worship? Or unless you're in private worship, right? So public and private is going to be another issue. It's important that we're not forsaking or giving up on meeting altogether, as in Hebrews 10, 25 says. To exercise the discipline of worship, we must first develop the habit of faithfully assembling with, physically with, other believers. The New Testament uses metaphors for the church, like body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, or building, Ephesians 2, 21, or household, referring, all those referring to the church, uh, Ephesians 2, 19. But each of those focus on the individual parts being part of a whole that, that cooperates, that only operates when they're together. We cannot deny that meeting together Quote, quote unquote meeting together means to worship God in a physical presence of other believers alright not only do the words themselves meeting together not only do the words themselves keep us from any other interpretation but think about this how can we ever misconstrue what was written to the Hebrews what other way were they going to worship Right? They didn't have another way to worship. So how can we misconstrue and misinterpret what's being said when it says don't, don't give up on meeting together? Basically, that's what forsake means, right? Don't give up on it. So why would we forsake the assembly? Why would we give up on the assembly when it's very easy, you know, very easy to see that the reason it was written is so they would be physically gathered together to meet and worship? Now, don't get me wrong. There's some very good reasons for videoing. Uh, there's very good reasons for sharing those videos, for broadcasting our worship. There's some excellent reasons for doing that. But we can't misconstrue the context either as this was, you know, there's no other way to do it. You know, by substituting, if we think about substituting media ministry for church attendance, by able-bodied members, well, that's not one. Of, that's not one of the reasons. Okay, that's not one of the reasons that video and broadcasting are good. But also in the same vein, we have to be careful that our private devo life and worship. Uh, you know, I think about this. If even though your private worship is fantastic, you know, you may be a very devoted private worshiper, you do devos every day, you uh, meditate, you pray, you you have all this Bible intake, but we still need corporate worship just as much as the Hebrews did when that was written to them. Okay? Now, on the other hand, before we leave, I do have time, right? One minute? Just one bit? Okay. On the other hand, there's experiences in private worship that we cannot get from public worship. So even though Jesus worshiped in a synagogue, he also went were withdrew to lonely places, as it says in Luke 5.16. We're often dissatisfied with our public worship because our private worship is not what it ought to be. Sometimes our study and our meditation limit what we get out of public worship. So what I'm doing Monday through Saturday limits the experience I get on Sunday. That's kind of the illustration. So if I'm limited by what I don't do, maybe I can take those limits off by cultivating those other disciplines as well. So private worship can actually complement public worship, and it does very much. Um, I'll. I liked and disliked this quote. Uh, people become like their focus, but uh, describing modern man, I've run across this. In describing modern man, quote, he worships his work, works at his play, and plays at his worship. Yeah, that's kind of uncomfortable to read, isn't it? That's kind of awkward. Why is that awkward? 
because it kind of hits home, doesn't it? I'm wondering if I will dedicate myself to defy that statement. Could I stand in defiance of that statement and say, you know what, I'm going to cultivate a discipline of worship. And I definitely need to because that quote right there kind of hits a little too close to home. Sometimes I'm guilty of that. So, you know, having a routine is not the same thing as spiritual discipline. Just having a routine. That routine's got to be exercised. You know, kind of like me reading Golf Digest. I'm never going to be a pro golfer just by reading Golf Digest. You know, we're never going to be we're never going to be what we want to be with worship if uh, just empty reading. Okay. All right. So a lot of spiritual disciplines uh, explored today, and uh, a lot to be learned about our worship. And uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry if I kept you a little late.